All right, so that's where we are today. We've been walking through this series. Those of you who are first timers here, uh, sure enough, we're asking questions. Uh, is God kind of a uh, series on apologetics, if you will, but it's a lot more about the character of God and who He is. And today we're going to ask the question, is he trustworthy? Now, like a lot of these questions, some of us, we might quickly um, just kind of go, yeah, I think so. Let's go. Let's go to lunch, you know, or whatever. But, but here's the thing. We all know this is true. We do believe it's easy to, you know, sit in a service singing to Jesus and yeah, he's trustworthy. And the experience of these baptisms and celebration of life change. But we all know when things go dark, when things get difficult, we do start to question whether I can trust him because things aren't going the way we think they ought to go. Um, We've all been through those seasons. And the older I get, the more I realize that much of life is really this sanctification process, becoming like Jesus, really is a lot about God just stripping away our idols. And that's kind of easy to talk about, but it is terrifying in real life. And some of you know what I'm talking about. If you've lived, let's say, past 25 years old, you likely might know what I'm talking about. About, I would say, eight, ten years ago, I went through a season, a really, really kind of dark night of the soul, where I went through a really hard time where things were being stripped away from me. My my dad passed away. I felt like I, I was not, you know, leading as well as I wanted to. I wanted to be, I want to be the best pastor that you all deserve and all the things. There was a lot going on. Um, certain things that I realized were actually idols in my life. Um, and so today what we're going to do is talk about this process of how God refines us um, and how challenging that can be, but how we can trust him through it. I've learned a lot of things. I'm still learning and growing through those dark and difficult times that we all face because that's a part of life, right? And of course, one of the greatest resources we have in all of of literature and all of scripture is the book of Job, okay? So I want you to grab your Bible and you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can track along with me, but grab your Bible because I won't be going through, you know, all of the passages I'll be referencing and talking about. You can track with me. Um, This book has just become one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, which might sound strange to say, but this book is incredible. Peter Kreeft is a theologian, probably has the best commentary on on this book. He says that um, the book of Job is is a lot like a child. Um, Reading the book of Job is like a child eating spinach. Um, Just close your eyes and open your mouth. Um, It is is not sweet tasting, um, but it'll put iron in your blood, and it will allow you to, uh, to come to grips with how we worship God through the hard times. And at the end of it all, a lot of us know Job is about a book about a man suffering and how to be faithful through suffering. But it's much more than that. What I've come to learn is the book is really about worship. Worshiping God through it all and what worship really is. In essence, do we worship God when all things are going well or do we worship him because of who he is? And the way I'm going to break this down, if you take notes on sermons um, and if you have your journal that we're walking through, our dwell journal, um, it's not the first Peter uh, passage that we read on Friday. It's, It's Job now. And as we looked at Ruth last week, we're going to look at really the entire book of Job, but I'm, I'm not going to, you know, clearly we're not going to read it like we did uh, Ruth, but along with seeking this kind of biblical literacy that we all need more and more of, we're going to look at the book of Job. This book um, has changed my life. And the way I'm going to break this down three ways, we're going to look at Job's dilemma, which is all of our dilemmas. Um, We're going to look at his deconstruction, I'm calling it. A lot of people talking about deconstruction of faith and such. I think he goes through that. I think we all do. Um, Then we're going to look at his declaration at the end, okay? What he comes to, and and there's a lot of twists in the story. So first, let's look at Job's dilemma. The entire book is set up in the first chapter, okay? And again, if you don't have your Bible, just listen in. Let's focus in. The first five verses tell us that this guy is the greatest in all the East, okay? He is, he's blessed. The, the writer goes to great lengths to tell us he's been given so much. He's the wealthiest man anywhere you can find. He's got this amazing family. On top of that, not only is he successful, uh, wealthy, but he is faithful to God. Those things don't always go together, but when they do, it's a beautiful thing. He is all in. 
And, and, and it's, it's like, this guy's blameless and he is innocent. That's key in setting up the story. Because we often think that, that you know, life really is just a law of reciprocity. Do well and things will go well for you. Do good and you, it'll be good. Don't do well, it will not go well with you. That's not what happens in this story. So this story, like so much of scripture, as we're reading it, it actually reads us. This is the power of this book. And by the way, the book of Job, unless you've read like the Iliad or you've read the Gilgamesh epic, the epic of Gilgamesh, this is the oldest book you've ever read. This is the oldest story that you've ever read. Many take it further back than Moses, okay? So uh, further back to, um, to, the, to the patriarchs, okay? About the time of Abraham. And so we've got the, we have the storyline, okay, of scripture, certainly. But this book is, is, I mean, there's a reason that this book has stood the test of time. It's one of the most spectacular, deepest short stories you'll ever read in your life. And my hope is that you'll see some of that today. This guy has done nothing wrong. But here's what's happened. You could set it up this way. Here's what's going on. The first, and the first chapter sets up the whole book. You could have on, if it's a play, on one side of the stage is, a, is, a, is a, just imagine a spotlight. Over here is Job, and he's living his life in the land of us, okay? He is, he's out there doing his thing, and we see what's happening, like us. Over here, we have God and Satan in the first chapter who are having a dialogue. Job knows nothing about what's going on over here, but we do. This is fascinating. We see what's happening behind the scenes, but this is truly, this is your life and mine. We see what's happening. God is up to something else. Now, this is, this is really an amazing, amazing story again. In verse uh, eight, okay, Job knows nothing about this. Verse eight, it says this. And the Lord said to Satan, here it is. Have you considered my servant Job? Now, look at this. Don't miss this. God points out Job. To Satan. And if Satan knew what was up, he'd be going, Say, what, wait, what, what? No, no, <laughs> what are you doing? Not me. He says, you can, have you considered my boy Job? That there is none like him on the earth. And look at this. God says, he labels him as blameless. God declares him blameless and upright man who fears God. He fears me and turns away from evil. Have you considered him? Like, wait, what? What is happening here? Like all things, God is setting this up. And then, y'all, verse 9. When I discovered that verse 9 is what is the key to unlock the entire book, changed everything uh, about how we approach this book. Look at verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Other translations, does he fear God for nothing? He's implying, watch this, of course he worships you. Look at how you've blessed him. All the verses prior to that are all about how he's blessed him, how he's just got everything going for him. He's got good health. He's got a family. He's so righteous and upright that he actually is offering sacrifices on behalf of his family just in case they sinned. Like, this guy's legit. He loves God. And so Satan is saying, no wonder he worships you. Look how you've blessed him. So here's the question that is asked. The key question that I want you to see is this. How would we know if Job worships God because of all that God has given him or simply because he's God? This gets to the heart of worship. Is he worshiping him because, okay, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me and it's all good. We're good. You, you're the great, you know, some kind of Amazon man in the sky. I'll click thing I want. As long as you give me what I want, I'm all in. If it doesn't happen this way, I am out. And many, we all struggle with this, don't we? Because we start to then wonder, God, what are you doing? I've got plans. And, and I have, you now all this is coming at me. And I want you to consider today what you're facing. Always seeking to apply what we're talking about here. Scripture for us is to apply into our lives. So what are you walking through these days? We're all struggling in varying degrees. And some of us are going through the hardest seasons of our lives right now. And a lot of it, for a lot of us, it's private. I mean, maybe some know. Some of us are wrestling with worry or anxiety or depression. We're struggling with, with relational issues and loss and grief. But you tell me, this is the brilliance of the book. How would we know? How would we know if we, you, 
worship God because of all that he's done for you. He's been so good to you. Or you worship him simply because of who he is, because he is God Almighty who's created me for his purposes. How would you know? Take it away, right? Take it away. Then we'd know. In fact, think about it. There's no other way we would know. That's the only way we would know. That's what sets up this entire book. But there's more going on here. There's actually kind of this divine wager going on. God is the one setting this up. God is saying, what about my boy Job? So now God's word is on the line. He's blameless and he's righteous. And then following that, the next verse, I mean, it's it's game on. Let's go. Let's find out. And that's what the rest of the book is about. And if you think that's that's kind of, that sounds kind of evil. Like, is God really But watch what happens. This book is amazing. And yes, it'll cause you to wrestle with God as you consider it and as you read it. So who's telling the truth here? Is it Satan or is it God? That's what we're going to find out. And then at the end of chapter 1, there's the famous line that you probably know. Naked I came into the world. Naked I leave. I came in with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. I came in naked. And I'm going to leave without anything at all. And then he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You're like, wow, okay. Then he says, you know what he says? What does he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. So a lot of us, all of us could say, I came into the world with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing. Everyone would say that. Like, yep, I get that. All of us would say, see, each of these phrases kind of ramp up. All of us would say, you know, yeah, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. He's in charge of everything. I get it. I I can't control my life. Very few of us, very Rarely do I hear, in the midst of that, blessed be the name of the Lord. Do it all. Whatever he wants, I still praise him. So at the end of chapter 1, gang, verse 21, he wins. Game over. What's the rest of the book about? That's what we're going to dive into because this is where we get into what it is to wrestle with so much loss in this life. And so chapter uh, chapter two, he finally gets ill. I mean, now he gets, he gets physically ill. This is when it re- this is the final straw. None of us can, can walk through illness very well, right? And Job's wa- his wife even, who has suffered a lot as well, by the way, she then says, um, you still believe God? Really? Curse God and die, she says. That's comforting. That's helpful, right? But here's the thing. We all grieve differently. That's what's going on. We all deal with loss differently. We do it in our families differently. But here's what happens. You enter into then Job, and we're not going to have time to go through all this, but he enters into these conversations now. The bulk of the book is his conversations with these rationalist friends that he has. And all of his friends simply offer worldly advice that we would give, that you'd hear from anybody. And here's how it plays out. They are considering this. There's about four or five things that they wrestle with with each of these friends. Brilliance of this book is, um, hey, Job, you're not so good. Now, something's up. Now, you seem like you're all good, but something is not right. You're not as good as you think you are because this wouldn't be happening to you. Again, we all think you've done something wrong, so you're being punished. This was clearly the theology of the day. That is not how God works, by the way, as we'll see. Secondly, maybe God's not good. Maybe that's what's up. If you're good, then he's not good. Uh, or, or, or how about this? Maybe he's not all powerful. He'd love to help you, but he can't. Or maybe he's not all loving. Because if he was all loving, he'd want to help you, right? Or how about this? And some of us are here today. Maybe God doesn't exist at all. Uh, That's what's up. I mean, why are we wrestling with God in all this? And yet, we all know that he does. We all know the simple cause and effect that we're here because you can't get something from nothing. You can't get living matter from non-living matter. Something is going on here. This sets up what theologians call the, the theistic set. There's a whole branch of theology called theodicy. Um, and and this the, the, the study of evil and suffering in the world. And um, I did some of my doctoral work in this, in this crazy... Here it is. Uh, evil itself is a mystery. Just evil that it is and suffering that it is is a mystery. But it's a problem for us because we don't understand it. 
it's not as much a problem as it is a mystery. It sets up the theistic set. So theodicy, theos, you hear this in the Greek, God, uh, DK is justice, okay? So the study is this, God as just in the face of evil and suffering. It's a vindication of God in the midst of suffering is what theodicy is. So it sets up a theistic set, which is this, track with me. Um, okay, God is all loving, agreed? Okay, God is all powerful, agreed? Evil exists, there's suffering. Um, yeah, we well, can't avoid that one. Uh, we all know this. So those three things true at the same time, existing together creates a problem. And primarily in Christianity, by the way, because we believe all three of those things. Not everybody does. Um, so here's how this plays out. Here's, here's what I've come to, and I'm getting f philosophical here, but this is so helpful for me. Uh, we assume if God were all loving, he would, he would want to remove all evil and suffering. Okay? Maybe not, evidently. I think we get tri tripped up on the second one. Track with me here. God is all powerful. He can do anything. How many believe that God can do anything? Raise your hand. He can do anything. Okay. He can, can he do this? Can he make a rock so big that he cannot move it? Can he do? Yes, he can do that. Wait, hold up. Then he can't move it. Wait, hold, wait. What? Hold up. Just wait. Can he make two mountains beside each other? Kids, track with me here. Can he make two, two big mountains with peaks beside each other without a valley in between? Oh, yeah, God can do anything. Mm. How about this? God can do anything that can be done. You with me? Like, that's illogical. There's certain things that cannot exist. They don't exist. So to ask God for that, here's the point. Here's where this goes. Can God create a world in which we are significantly free to choose to love him or not to love him where evil does not exist? Can he? Evidently not. Or he would have done so. In fact, I could argue that evil is simply the choice that we make that's not good. You see, and the Bible tells us that sin has not only created problems within us, uh, it's a condition of our hearts, so we can't rescue ourselves. And, and the sin has also impacted all, all, all of life and all the universe. I mean, it's a cosmic problem. And, and so what we see here is that God gives us free will to choose him or not, because look at this, we say this often, true love is chosen love, right? Right? To choose to love him or not to love him, thus sin. And all that comes with that that leads to so much suffering in this world. Now we have gratuitous suffering and we don't have time to get into that. That we could talk about for a while which is big. But we know that true love is chosen love. And when we choose not to love him, then that leads to all kinds of problems. Here's the problem with Job. In the midst of all of his conversations with his friends... He needs a mediator. He needs an advocate. He didn't have one. And all of his friends, nobody's advocating for him. He doesn't have friends around him. And in the midst of all of this, y'all, look at this in chapter 19. I want you to see this. Chapter 19, verse 25. He says, in the midst of all this, all that's coming at him, for I know that my Redeemer lives. What? And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been dis thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, in my flesh, I shall see God. What? Whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, not another. He said, I'm going to see him myself. Not somebody else, me. I am going to see him. My heart faints within me. He's just like, I'm undone. I, I, I can't handle this, but I believe. And what, what is he talking about here? Like, again, this is thousands of years ago. This is before the Christ event. This is before all the New Testament. But again, it looks like he's won the wager. He's staying faithful through it all, and that's what's happening. But, but here's all of his friends, and we all know this. We do believe that if you do well, things will go well with you. If you don't, yeah, you're going to pay the price. And we still kind of do what his friends are doing with him. But y'all, and, and those of us in our church right now, 
some of the finest people I know right now are going through some of the darkest moments and most unimaginable pain and suffering. Some of the most committed believers I know right now. And some of you know, I'm talking about the Petersons, among others, who are just wrestling with so much, and yet they continue to stay faithful. So here's what, what we see now is what I call Job's deconstruction, all right? So, so hang with me here. Deconstruction, a lot of people you know, are deconstructing their faith. We're hearing a lot about that. It's where we kind of drift off of Orthodox Christianity, or it's we've been hurt by people who claim to follow Jesus, maybe you know, church hurt. And some of you here today, and you used to go to church and used to be committed, and you're not anymore. And it's because, well, you got a million reasons. Well, that person and that thing, and then that happened. I don't like that person. And then the, you know, the pastor, I don't know about him. And then, that, and then that person just hurt me, and now I'm out. And, and I, would, I, would, I want to challenge you. It never was about any person. And what's happened is even the evil one has caused you to be broken away from the body of Christ instead of focusing on Jesus and knowing that he's greater. He's the perfect one. There are no perfect friends. There's no perfect church. Bunch of imperfect people who are just seeking the Lord. And so this is noteworthy that Job, through it all, he struggles. Yes, he struggles with friends, but he struggles with God. He's, he's wrestling with God throughout. And this is the encouragement I want to bring to you today. As a young man, Nikos uh, Kazanstakis, he's a, um, a Greek uh, journalist, writer. And he tells a story in his um, autobiography where he goes to Father Macarius, um, this sage, old, wise monk, okay? And he goes to him and he describes this conversation. He says to the old monk, do you still wrestle with the devil, Father Macarius? And he answered, uh, not any longer, my child. I have grown old now and he has grown old with me. He doesn't have the strength. I wrestle with God. With God, I exclaimed in astonishment, and you hope to win? No, I hope to lose, my child. My bones remain with me still, and they continue to resist. I want God to take me down. Have you come to that point in your life? Because then look what happens in Job 23. It says this, then Job answered and said, today... All also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Don't you want to do this? He's saying, if I had my day in court, I would tell God some things. I've got some questions that I want to ask him. And then some of you know what happens in this story. Then, uh, what happened, he has no advocate, but he says, if I had my day in court, I would represent myself. And then here's what happens. Uh, it's in chapter 38, yeah, verse 1 through 3. Then the Lord answered Job uh, out of a whirlwind and said, who is this that darkened my counsel? Who's throwing shade at my wisdom? By words without knowledge. Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Uh-oh. He's saying, put on your big boy pants, Job. I've got questions for you. And so then what happens for the next few chapters, before we get to the end of it all, a part of his deconstruction and wrestling with God, we see what happens in Job 38, verse 4 through 7, really just um, representative questions. Hey, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Like, I, I created all things. Do you, do you know the dimensions? Come on, tell me. Uh, who's, you know, have you stretched across, you know, lying across it all? Do you understand the footings? Do you, you don't even know, Job. This earth is floating out in the middle of space. You don't even know this. I have created all things. Who did this? And who was there when the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? I was there. I created everything. And you're asking me all these questions. I can take your questions, but I want you to see this. He doesn't advocate for Job. He doesn't say, you know what? You're innocent, bro. Let me explain your, your suffering. Let me give you three points on why this is happening. He does none of that. God says, let me tell you who I am. And then he goes through this virtual uh, tour of the universe. 
And he says to him things like, um, hey, where does light come from? Tell me that. Hey, who, who stopped the shore, the, the ocean from stopping right there? Who, who decided where the shoreline would be? And hey, do you see the cubs up in the mountains who were born to the, to the mother bear? I see it. And by the way, Job, I send rain to places nobody lives. I have flowers growing all over the planet that no person will ever see. I'm taking care of the entire universe. Do you, have you ever been on the backside of the moon? I'm there right now. Do you even know what's happening with the stars? And, and you have no idea how big and awesome I am. He's saying, you can trust me. You're going to need a God like me. This is what he's doing. He's not simply rebuking him. He's saying, I'm telling you, I've got this and I've got you. And then there's an interlude. This is almost humorous. It says in, in Job 40, look at this. And the Lord said to Job, shall, shall a fault finder contend with the almighty? Like he's, he's like, okay. He who argues with God, let him answer. Let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am of small account. Okay, I've been right-sized. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I've spoken once. I will not answer twice. Uh, that'll be enough. I'm done. Like I'm tapped out. I am out. I get it. You're God, I'm not. I will trust in you. I needed to hear that. And then here's what happens. God says, uh, no, I'm not done yet. And so then, then he keeps going. He comes back at him with the same language. This is actually kind of humorous. You feel for Job a bit, but then he says, uh, nope, put on your big boy pants again. Get ready for action. I'm not done. And he goes for two more chapters, and he goes off again. And at the end of it all, after his dilemma, after his deconstruction, then and wrestling with God, then we get to Job's declaration. Here's how this lands. This is so beautiful. He, he ends the virtual tour, God does, by saying, I can tame anything. And I can tame you, and I can bring you to, to me, and I am better than anything you're going to. I am all loving. I do not change. I am all powerful. And then it says in Job 42, this is beautiful. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Do you believe that today? Who, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? This is God speaking. Therefore, I, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things that are too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, you said. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard, listen to this. After, remember, chapter one, he loses everything. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you go, he won. But look at what he says here. I'd heard of you. By the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Like I thought I knew you, but now I've seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Another way of saying, I, I didn't know what I was saying. I thought I loved you, but now I've seen you. Friends, here's the point. There's certain things about God. In fact, we will only come to him through experience with him through wrestling with him and staying in and continue to trust him regardless of what comes our way. And right now, what I want you to do is consider this. God, here, here's what happens. Job doesn't get his answers, nor will you always. He gets something better. He gets God. <laughs> he gets God. And that's really what we're after, isn't it? Because on this side of eternity, we're not going to get all of our answers. But we can get him. We can keep running to him. God is not the answer man. He is the answer. See, God, God's answer is himself. And so he comes to us, watch this, in the person of Jesus. We know a lot more than Job knew. God has shown up in the flesh, in the person of Christ. And it's by faith that we receive him, not by our works or whether we're good enough or whether the scales will work in our favor. They don't work in your favor. They never will. Because sin has taken us away from God and it is a condition of the heart. We need rescue. God says, I'll, I'm coming straight to you. Christ the Redeemer comes. Watch this. He dies on the cross for us, for our sin. 
to take away all of our shame, all of our struggles, all of our sin upon himself. He's buried and he's raised up again so that we too could receive by faith the life he gives to us. We could die to ourselves even now. And someday when we all will die, we're buried. We too are raised up with him. He's the first one that we follow after. And so friends, listen, you can say today, along with me and others here, you can say with Job, we can say with clarity, I know that my savior, my redeemer, he rose from the grave and he was standing on the earth. And there's coming a day when he will stand on the earth, a new, a new earth created by him, a resurrected people worshiping a resurrected savior on a resurrected earth. That's where all of history is heading. And there's coming a day when we will see our redeemer standing on the earth. God's answer to our suffering, here it is, is Jesus. He did not turn away from you in your suffering. He has come to us Friends, you cannot say that he's done nothing. He doesn't understand what I'm going through. He understands fully what you're going through. He's been there and more. He tasted death. He's experienced it all. And so today, I want to challenge you. Can you embrace the one who is the answer? Have you done so? Can you say there was a time when you devoted your life to him, you committed your life to him? Because in Romans 8, we look at this passage often, 28, 29, we go to it often and say, well, God works in all things, right? For, for, for those who love him, he, he works for the good. Not all things are good, but he, only God can do this, working to make all things good according to those who are called according to his purpose. But then we miss, miss the, la, the second verse. What's his purpose? Those he foreknew, he has planned ahead of time to be conformed into the image of Jesus. The purpose of your life and mine is to be conformed into the image of Jesus. If that's your ultimate goal, friends, this is a game changer. If your purpose in life is to, yes, receive his grace and to respond to his great love for you and to become like Jesus, because that's where the flourishing is. That's where the joy is. That's where peace and life is found in loving others like Jesus loves us. If that's your purpose, then you can, you can say at times of deep, dark, uh, difficult times, d- dark nights of the soul, depression and anxiety and all the struggles and relational loss and grief, you can stand with him and say, I am being conformed into your image right now. And I will trust you in it because I want to become more like you. All for my good and to your glory. That's why I'm alive. And friends, if that's your posture today, we want to close the service in a really special way. We have a moment where we're going to have a time for you just to to wrestle with what you've heard today. And I want you to consider all that you're going through. We're going we're gonna to sing a song over you, okay? So just stay focused. We got time. And, and we're going we're gonna to sing a song over you. And, and I want to ask you this. What story will you tell of your life? What story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell, well, I tried my best. I, I, I thought I, maybe, God, I think I, my good outweighed my bad. Is that your story? Well, I want to be wealthy like Job. I'm just key. I keep pursuing it. I want to be successful. I just want to, I want to, I want all that. I, is that going to be your story? Or will your story be, Lord, whatever I go through in life, because I'll have a lot of loss and grief. The longer you live, the more you'll experience it. Lord, I trusted you and you were enough for me. What story will you tell to your children and to your grandchildren? And when you're, when you're dead and gone, what will be your story? Throughout this song that we're going to, I'm going to pray here in a moment. And throughout the song, you'll be prompted along the way by the Spirit to say to the Lord, and I'm going to ask you to do this. We can, we can bow our heads and close our eyes. But there'll be moments where you're going to be prompted as you pray. You're going to say, Lord, here I am. Maybe for you at first it's, Lord, I'm, I'm suffering. And this is for nobody else but for you. Here I am, and Lord, I just bring myself to you. Maybe for you, it's I, I receive your grace, Lord, I, I receive, I repent. I repent. I thought I was in charge of my life, and I'm not. 
I give you my life. Maybe for you it's, Lord, I still believe. I still believe. I'm trusting in you right now. Through it all, I trust you. I give you my life anew. Whatever it is for you, it'll prompt you along the way. And I just want you to just hold your hand up and you put it back down. And then maybe another, another moment as you pray. Oh, Lord, um, yes, here I am. So I want us to do that as we hear this song sung over us. Okay, so let's all bow our heads and close our eyes as we close our time together. And I want to just pray over us now. So Lord, we, um, we give you our lives. You are enough for us. All that we've heard and seen, the story of Job, we bring ourselves before you because we're all struggling, we're all hurting in various ways. So we give you our lives anew. And friend, maybe if you've never received Christ, you need to know no one will ever care for you like him. He's longing for you to come to him. Say yes to him. And respond as he prompts you now by his spirit. As we continue to pray in Jesus' name.